Welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. Today, I want to reflect back on a topic which I discussed in our season on consequentialism. In one of the episodes where I talked about the moral conundrum of lying, I had mentioned Augustine as being against lying for any reason. And I had seen some of his quotes on the issue, but since my case was more, uh, mostly philosophical and it didn't really rely ultimately on his take, I never really read Augustine's full work. So I finally got around to reading his works, though. Works, plural, which I didn't realize. He's got, he's got a book called Against Lying and one called On Lying. And I actually didn't realize that they were, were two different ones. Uh, so I just kind of stumbled on that. But anyway, I just finished reading both of his works on lying. And I wanted to double back on that issue um, because I think consequentialism is always good to come back to, but also because I think out of most of the moral conundrums, the lying thing is probably the one that's hardest for us to stomach. It just seems crazy that we shouldn't lie to save somebody's life. It seems nuts. Um, at least it, it does to me, and it still does to me, and I, admittedly, I can't say what I would do in a situation um, where that came up. I would hope that God would, would guide me accordingly and allow me to be be wise and... and um, not devious, but whatever. R- r- uh, wise as a serpent in that situation. So I do recommend that you go back and listen to the episode on lying, listen to the season on consequentialism, because that's going to be a, an important foundation for the discussion today. But I will recap it just a little bit for, uh, for those who might be interested. So in the season on consequentialism, uh, I identified consequentialism as a, a big problem for humans in general, but especially a problem for pragmatic American society. While Christians talk all the time about bemoaning moral relativism in society and we claim to have objective moral truth, we so often find ourselves compromising what we say are our morals in order to be effective. And that's just the ends justifying the means. That's not objective morality. That's situational or circumstantial morality. We oftentimes use metaphor or ignorance to cover over what we don't want to know morally and to excuse what we want to do immorally. Oh, Jesus didn't really mean what he said. That's hyperbole. And certainly Jesus does use hyperbole, but we seem to overapply Jesus' revolutionary teachings and then wonder why he doesn't seem very revolutionary to us. His actions were worth him getting killed 2,000 years ago, but, you know, been there, done that. We, we understand Jesus, and now his teachings aren't really something that people want to kill us for. So the hard things that Jesus taught us, especially about wealth and sacrifice, um we kind of turn those sorts of situations into conundrums or or metaphors and, and those sorts of things. For as black and white as we think are, are, as we think we are, our gray zone is pretty big. And I'm okay with grays, usually. The problem is that our gray zone isn't where it should be and is instead conveniently placed over the areas of our lives that we don't want touched. We see this especially in areas related to, as I said before, our money, our wealth, comfort, and uh, convenience. So in season two, we explored several examples of what we say are moral conundrums. We talked about ectopic pregnancies, mash baby, voting for an evil party or candidate, lying to save lives, and I think that's it. I think that's what we covered. In the episode on lying, I concluded that lying wasn't just something which could be excused for Christians. We talked about how if lying were moral, then we could have no confidence that God wasn't a liar. We differentiated between moral commands as morals which could be turned on and off, like telling your kid that they can use the stove while you're there so you can supervise, um, while when you're not there, they can't use the stove. We compared that type of command to moral imperatives, so moral commands versus moral imperatives, which uh, 
moral imperatives I defined as objective morals to which we are always obliged because these things directly tie to God's character and are immutable and eternal. So love. This is why love was such a big deal to Augustine. He recognized that in no matter and no matter what you did, even if it's killing somebody, that had to be tied to love. If it if it uh, broke the law of love, then it wasn't right. And so, whereas the the nonviolent individuals before Augustine said, "I can't kill somebody out of love," Augustine didn't change the law of love, but what he said is, "We can love people while we kill them," under under particular circumstances, at least. So when we take a look at lying, lying directly contradicts a characteristic of God, his truthfulness, his purity. It is therefore morally imperative that we do not engage in lying. We looked at what options this left us with in situations like those in Nazi Germany, where people were hiding Jews. And while untruth is against God's nature, I discussed the options of uh, deceit or silence. I knew that some people would contend the the issue of deceit, and I guess the jury's still out on that. I'd be willing to be uh, convinced otherwise. But it seems like the Bible gives us some pretty clear examples of God encouraging and using deceit himself. And so then I, I discussed how deceit is not a qualitative thing. It's not a changing of information, but rather a quantitative thing. It's a giving of only a certain amount of information. And those in authority have the um, have the moral ability to give more or less information to subordinates. Therefore, God can give people the amount of information he wants, and he can withhold other information. That's his prerogative. So deceit I don't think is off the table morally because it's quantitative, not qualitative, and it has more to do with with authority. Um, so a kid lying to his parents about where he was, yeah, the, uh, he is not an authority over his parent, so therefore that deceit is immoral. But in other situations like seeing a decapitated body on the side of the road and having your kids in the car ask you, hey, daddy, what was that? And saying, uh, the there are medical personnel on the scene, and they are taking care of the the victims, right? Not lying. It is deceptive. I would consider that deceptive, but it might be information that those kids don't really need at that time. We closed out the episode on lying with examples of seeming lies from the Bible or clear lies from the Bible, and discussed whether those were approved or not, and and we delved into that. So it was probably one of my favorite episodes that I've done because I think I think it goes against the grain, but I also think that there's so much um, there's so much weight there, and it really you're able to unpack that. And to me, the evidence seems pretty clear that lying is wrong, and that issue just gets at the heart of consequentialism. All right, so with that behind us, let's get into today's episode proper. Augustine's work on lying in his two books, On Lying and Against Lying. Now you should know that when we talk about Augustine's work on lying, these two books are slightly different. And I don't know that I really understand the nuances. I haven't uh, researched the books. I mean, my, my reading list is just extremely long at the moment. So the fact that I was able to get to these books and read them, they are, they are relatively short each, but the language is, is a bit difficult. But the fact that I got to these is is a miracle. Um, so I didn't have time to do like history research on them. But they they seem like they are written to um, the one situation is pretty easy to understand. There's this guy who's writing to Augustine and and asking about certain methods to weed out heretics. Like he wants to to know if he can lie to uncover these dens of heretics so that they can you know, uh, punish them and and get them out of the church. And Augustine is responding to that. The other one, I'm not exactly sure what the context is, but I, um, I definitely liked one more than the other, and I'm trying to remember which one it is. I think it was the against lying, but I've, I've only got a 50% chance that that's right. Whatever. Um, he says a lot of the same things in each. I don't know that it's necessarily worth reading both of them, 
I like the one where he is responding to the guy about uh, persecution or um, heretics. Augustine's answer to lying is that lying is always wrong. But he ends up identifying something like six to eight ways in which a, a lie could be told. And he kind of goes through these different scenarios and sort of argues with himself, which I kind of like. Like he goes kind of back and forth and gives rebuttals. And, and that's exactly the process that, that I go through. Uh, I have arguments with myself all the time. I'll, I'll talk to my wife and I'll, uh, I'll say, what do you think about this? It's like, I already have a rebuttal to that, but I want to know what you think. So Augustine has these, has these various ways in which a lie can be told. For example, I can tell a lie which does me good and it does another harm, like a criminal who frames a different person for the crime. I could tell a lie that doesn't do me any good, but seeks to do good for another, like telling someone on the street that they look beautiful, you know, cheer somebody up, make them have a good day. Augustine is going to identify all of these, all of the ways that he, he mentions as wrong, though there are times when he writes in a way which makes it seem that he's really struggling with that conclusion. For instance, in both works, he brings up the issue of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says that when the townspeople wanted to rape the angels, um, he sympathized with Lot's willingness to throw his daughters out to the mob to be raped instead. So that, I mean, let that sink in. That's, that's kind of crazy. But Augustine saw the raping of Lot's daughters as a lesser evil than should a mob rape those of the same gender. And he assumed that they're of the same gender. I've also heard other people say that the, um, you know, if, you, if you listen to Matthew Vines on homosexuality, his, um, one of his arguments about what was particularly bad about the sexual sin of Sodom, which um, is only highlighted in a, in a couple passages. A lot of the other passages highlight the, uh, the injustice uh, to the poor and, and their gluttony and stuff. But on the, on the passages that emphasize the sexual immorality, Matthew Vines would say that the issue here is actually more of a Genesis, what is it, Genesis 6 type issue, um, where it's, uh, they are kind of doing like the nef- Nephilim thing, uh, where the, the people of Sodom are trying to have sex with other beings. It's not, you know, because an angel, is an angel a man? Uh, Maybe they, they thought they were the appearance of men, so therefore it's considered homosexuality. Uh, whatever it is, um, that, anyway, that would be another discussion. But Augustine assumes that these angels are men and assumes that the problem is that Sodom wants to sodomize these men. And so he's like, when, when Lot considered throwing his daughters out, he's like, I kind of get that. I get why Lot wanted to do that because hey, he'd be pre- preventing a much greater evil. And it could also have something to do with the fact that in the, in the Middle East, when you had guests, you were extremely responsible for them. So I don't know how hospitality plays into Lot's um, responsibility for his guests, but as a father, I would think that he has quite a lot of responsibility to his kids. But then again, it's patriarchal women, whatever. So now, Augustine doesn't approve that Lot did this, but he said that he understands. And there are some times where, where he uses this and he, he kind of talks about lying in a similar manner, where it's like, it seems like this would be a lesser evil, but it's still not good. Uh, and we, we can't participate in that. And I'll give you some quotes later where Augustine essentially says, hey, look, you're not responsible for preventing other people from sinning because that's their sin. You, your job is to make sure that you don't sin. Now, the places where Augustine seems to to have the biggest issue is different than probably where we would. When it comes to somebody dying, Augustine doesn't seem to struggle all that much, from what I remember, with with lying. It's like, well, no, you don't you don't lie. The things that seem to bother Augustine, uh, the thing that seems to bother Augustine the most is when it comes to these things, I think he calls them defiling sins. So if you were going to be, so let's say you, a man, were going to be raped by another man, uh, and you could lie to get yourself out of that situation, especially if that lie is not going to hurt anybody, 
Augustine has a real big problem with saying not to lie. Just the thought, like, he's like, oh, you'd be, you'd be so defiled, like these defiling sins. And, and that seems to be his biggest hang-up. So it is interesting that, you know, some people might argue that Augustine um, isn't like 100%, oh, yes, never, and I'm, I'm passionate about never lying. He does kind of waver slightly uh, in, in his debate with himself, but it's over completely different areas of the moral spectrum than what we would have problems with. Not that any of us would want to be, in his words, defiled, but um, yeah, because uh, he gets into other defiling sorts of things too. It's not just homosexuality. Um, yeah. Point is, Augustine stands firm always that lying isn't justified even in, in the area that's hardest for him to comprehend. In light of Augustine's ultimate conclusion, I want to pull out some quotes from, from his works. And some of them are pretty extended, and um, I'm just going to read them anyway, and I'll, I'll quote and end quote so that you can follow along. Also, I will put these quotes in, in the show notes so you can read them, because uh, the language makes it somewhat difficult. All right, so here we go. In the first quote, Augustine is going to pit truth against falsehood. It's essentially the character of God issue we talked about in our recap. How can we lie if untruth is antithetical to God? What is especially important here is that Augustine recognizes that even if we can't see any possible downside to our lie, participating in a lie does something to us. In our co-mingling with falsehood, something happens to our soul and our character. It pits us against God. What I find especially interesting about this concept is that you see the same thing from black voices in regard to racial oppression. Frederick Douglass and MLK both talked about the bondage of white oppressors. These white oppressors were in bondage by their choice to hate and participate in evil. They recognized uh, while black people were enslaved in some ways, um, even under literally with Frederick Douglass and and figuratively with MLK, um, really their white oppressors were enslaved too, which is a very biblical concept of being enslaved to sin. Now, that's hard for us to imagine in terms of lying, particularly with little white lies. And, and maybe there's bondage to a lesser degree, but participating in that which is counter to God is bondage. So here's Augustine's quote. Quote, Of lies are many sorts, which indeed all, universally, we ought to hate. For there's no lie that is not contrary to truth, For, as light and darkness, piety and impiety, justice and iniquity, sin and right doing, health and weakness, life and death, so are truth and lie contrary the one to the other. Whence by how much we love the former, by so much ought we to hate the latter. Yet in truth there be some lies which to believe does no harm, although even by such sort of lie to wish to deceive is hurtful to him that tells it, not to him that believes it. So Augustine, uh, to, to tack on one part I didn't kind of preview there, you know, he's saying that uh, sometimes lies, if you, if you believe a lie, it might not be harmful to you. It might be a harmless lie. Like if I say, do I look fat in this dress? And you say, no. Well, you just lied, but... You know, that might not do me any harm. But it could do me harm if I am overweight and I need to, and, and that it affects my health, then you have basically facilitated comfort for yourself by refusing to tell me truth and uh, cause me to confront something that I don't want to confront. Or at the same time, it could be feeding my vanity. I mean, that that lie could have serious ramifications in my life, um, especially if it's a repeated lie and it's, it's something um, that, that mars my soul. But ultimately, there are lies that we're told, which really don't affect us, doesn't harm us, but the person who tells it, it does harm. It does damage to their soul. All right, let's move on to another quote from Augustine. 
In pacifist circles, Augustine is famous for his inner disposition of the heart idea. Basically, Augustine says that one can kill somebody else, and if the slayer is appropriately authorized, like uh, being a soldier for the state, the state has appropriate authority, then the killing is fine so long as his heart has love for the victim. Now, this is in part why Augustine has a pretty rigid qualification that that we, especially Americans, don't have today because we can shoot an intruder that comes into our house. But Augustine says that you know, if somebody comes into your house to harm you, he's like, I can't imagine any scenario where you can kill out of love because there's going to be fear or hatred or there's going to be something involved that causes you to kill. You're not going to be able to do it in a sterile fashion, in a fashion that is disimpassioned. Whereas if you kill from the state and the state says, hey, look, we, we figured out that this is a just cause, go do that. And he says, oh, well, if they just tell me to go do my job, then I'm just doing a job and they must be right. And I don't really have hatred towards this person or this group. So yeah, I can go kill out of love. Now, that that is like so ridiculous that you know, to think that you wouldn't have hatred for other people or other groups or that you know when you're in battle you don't have fear and all of these things that would that would cause you to kill not out of love but augustine is just trying to say hey look if there are any circumstances where you can kill out of love the only way i can see it is if you're fighting for the state you got a chance but he recognizes that the disposition of the heart even when you kill it has to be in love It took me by surprise then, when Augustine speaks in several places, that while motive can change the severity of the sin, a wrong is still a wrong, even if it's in lesser degrees. In the first quote in this this series here, Augustine explains this in terms of thievery. He says the following, quote, Some man will say, So then any thief, whatever is to be accounted equal with that thief who steals with will of mercy? Who would say this? But of those two, it does not follow that any is good because one is worse. He is worse who steals through coveting, though he who steals through pity. But if all theft be sin, from all theft we must abstain. For who can say that people may sin, even though one sin be damnable, another venial? But now we are asking, if a man shall do this or that, who will not sin or who will sin? Not who will sin more heavily or lightly, end quote. So Augustine's just saying, hey, look, stealing's always wrong. Doesn't matter if you do it out of mercy, like Robin Hood, steal to, from the rich, give to the poor, or if you do it out of um, a heart that covets. It doesn't matter. It's all wrong. Now, One is more wrong, to steal out of coveting as opposed to stealing out of mercy is more wrong, but just because one's more wrong than the other doesn't mean that they're not both wrong. So, sin's a sin. And Augustine is relating this to lying, but again, me coming from a nonviolent standpoint, then I I think, well, why did you throw off then the the 300 years of of nonviolence in uh, in Christianity and, and try to excuse it as an inner disposition of the heart? Um, so anyway, I I just thought that was interesting. But Augustine goes on to give another example, specifically using Peter's betrayal. He says, quote, Apostle Peter had that in his heart, which he had on his lips when he denied Christ. Surely in that denial, he held the truth within and uttered the lie without. Why then did he wash away the tears, the denial which he uttered with his mouth? if that sufficed for salvation, that with the heart he believed. Why, speaking the truth in his heart, did he punish with so bitter weeping the lie which he brought forth with his mouth, unless because he saw it to be a great and deadly evil, that while with his heart he believed unto righteousness, with his mouth he made no confession unto salvation. So let's take the concrete example of Peter here. Augustine says, look, Peter was a disciple of Christ. I mean, clearly in his heart, he followed and loved Christ. So when he denied Christ with his mouth, what's the big deal, Peter? Why are you crying? Like, you know what you really believe. Um, What you said was a lie. It didn't match what was in your heart. But Augustine is saying that it doesn't matter 
what was in Peter's heart because he uttered a lie, right? He uttered a falsehood. He uttered this thing that was, that was problematic, that was a betrayal. Um, so the, the, this inner disposition of the heart doesn't get you out of the sin of lying. It doesn't matter what your intention is. Augustine moves on from here to point out the hypocrisy and intuition involved in all this justification that we try to do for lying. In Against Lying, Augustine is writing specifically about the issue of how to handle heretics. He points out to his friend that we cannot lie to rout out heretics because lying is never justified. Augustine proves this point by showing us how ludicrous the logic goes with other sins. Augustine says the following, quote, Why then do we not rout out heretics in order to their being caught by the flesh committing lascivi- lasciviousness in adultery? and yet think right to rout them out by mouth, committing fornication and blasphemy. For either it will be lawful to defend both the one and the other with equal reason, that these things be therefore said to be not unjust, because they were done with intention of finding out the unjust. Or, if sound doctrine wills, not even for the sake of finding out heretics that we should have to do with unchaste women, albeit only in body, not in mind, Assuredly, not even for the sake of finding out heretics, wills it that by us, albeit only in voice, not in mind, either unclean heresy were preached or the chaste Catholic Church blasphemed. And I love this. I, I use this same concept when it comes to, to violence. Um, where I ask, why in war is it okay to murder, to kill? Let's, let's take out the, the uh, pointed expression, to kill. Right, that a, a thing that would otherwise be wrong is fine, but to rape in war, you know, to to mess with the enemy's mind, to subdue them, to suppress them, to demoralize them, rape is wrong. Uh, Augustine says the same thing with lying. He said, "Okay, so you want to get rid of some heretics, and you're saying, what's the big deal of telling a lie? Like, would you say the same thing about committing adultery? Would you say?" Hey, look, I, you know, I'm going to sleep with one of the leaders of this of this sect so that I can get in into the organization, and then I can get the names of everybody of every heretic, and we can get rid of them. You'd say, "Oh no, that's that's fornication uh, with the body." He says, "Well, okay, so what? If you fornicate with your body, but not with your mind, if your if your mind has the intention, all right, to root out these heretics, then so what? Why not fornicate?" He said, "You know why you don't fornicate." Because it's wrong. It's a problem. It's a sin. And so what you're basically saying is, I'm going to fornicate with my mouth. You know, not with my mind, right? My, my heart's right. I'm trying to root out heretics. I'm not, I'm not lying for a bad cause. And Augustine says, R- ridiculous. You recognize the intuition of, uh, of holiness and not sinning in these other situations. But, um, you know, you, you backtrack on this. So Augustine uses our intuitions with these in these other areas to highlight the problem with lying. And again, I would reiterate that I think you can do the same thing with, with killing. So Augustine goes on from here and continues his thoughts, and he explores a deeper problem that this duplicity, this, uh, this viewing of lying is okay, but these other things is wrong. He, he shows us where this duplicity leads us, and it leads us to be moral relativists. While we modern conservative Christians claim to love objective morality, Augustine would call us out on our hypocrisy. Augustine says the following, quote, But he who says that some lies are just must be judged to say no other than that some sins are just, and therefore some things are just which are unjust, than which what can be more absurd? For whence is a thing a sin, but for that it is contrary to justice? Be it said, then, that some sins are great, some small, because it is true. And let us not listen to the Stoics who maintain all to be equal. But to say that some sins are unjust, some just, what else is that to say than there be some unjust and some just iniquities? End quote. My opinion, Augustine is, is spot on here. It's double talk to say that lying is a sin, but... Sometimes lying's a righteous sin. How can something be a, a just injustice or a righteous unrighteousness or a good sin? 
Such moral language doesn't work with moral issues tied to the nature of God. However, Augustine notes here, as he does elsewhere, that this doesn't mean there aren't greater and lesser sins or greater and lesser degrees of a sin. If someone lied to save the lives of Jews in the Holocaust, I'd be happy that the lives were saved. Augustine mentions something very similar with the Hebrew midwives saving the infants in Egypt and with Rahab saving the spies. While he doesn't condone their lies, he says that they clearly had faith in God and were moving towards righteousness and towards a greater good. They weren't blameless, and they should have been. God could have provided a way out of no way for them in their honesty if he had wanted. But there are clearly degrees of immorality here. So while in the Consequentialist series my goal is to help us see the true, deep Christian values, my goal is not at all to be legalistic and harp on all sins. I pray that God moves us forward in the process of sanctification and that we could all one day be in a place where we could trust God enough with our lives to be blameless. But this isn't an uh, an exercise in judgmentalism or legalism. It's about getting to know God more and desiring to be more like him. It's about conformity to the image of Christ, which is our ultimate goal as Christians. All right, so let's get to the big question that I know we all have. We can understand the philosophy and theology behind lying so far, but what about reality? What about uh, when life happens? What happens when we're finally faced with lying to save a life? Do we refuse to lie? And if so, why? Here's Augustine's short answer. Quote, Commit not thou a great crime thine own, while thou dreadest a greater crime of other men. For be the difference as great as thou wilt between thine own and that of others, this will be thine own. End quote. I think that's so succinct and beautiful. We are responsible for our actions. We can't control what other people do. And uh, we don't want to cause people to sin, but it's not our responsibility to stop others from sinning and to do so, especially by sinning ourselves. I tell my kids this all the time. We are not culpable for the evil someone else does. Um especially if it requires us to do wrong. If a terrorist holds my family hostage and tells me to murder one of my kids or he'll murder them all, that is not on me to kill one of my kids. If I refuse to murder one of my kids and the terrorist then kills them all, that is not on me. That's on him. Even though I could have prevented it, assuming that the terrorist was telling the truth, um, that's, that sin is on him. Now, Augustine gives two specific specific examples for us to chew on here in regard to this. First, he tells of someone who tries to get you to fornicate, or she'll kill herself, right? I've never had this problem, and I don't know that anybody else ever does. Uh, If somebody is that attractive and compelling of a person that somebody says that they'll kill themselves unless you fornicate with them, nevertheless... Augustine, um, maybe if if any of the church fathers had a one-track mind, maybe Augustine did, at least it seems this way, and from what little I know of his background, uh, probably persisted. But Augustine's like, hey, you know, I've got this problem. People tell me that they're going to kill themselves if if I don't fornicate with them. So uh, um, what's his response? If you refuse to have sex with someone, are you then responsible for their subsequent suicide? Here's his quote. Quote, For if a lewd woman crave of you the gratification of her lust, and when you consent not, she, perturbed with the fierceness of her love, should die, will chastity also be a murderer? Or, truly, because we read, read, we are the sweet savor of Christ in every place, both in them which are saved and in them which perish, to the one indeed a uh, a savor of life unto life, to others a savor of death unto death. Shall we pronounce even the savor of Christ to be a murderer? But for that we being men are in questions and contradictions of this sort for the most part overcome or wearied out by our feeling as men. For that very reason has the apostle also presently subjoined. And who is sufficient for these things? A second similar example that Augustine gives is there's this man who's really frail. His son's off in battle. And news has come to you about his son, 
and the man wants to know if his son is still alive or if he has died in battle. Now, you know that the news, let's just say you know somehow, that the news 100% is going to cause this man to give up on life and die right then and there. He's going to have a heart attack right in front of you. Are you responsible to lie in order to prevent his death? Nay, for these persons who are so enamored of this life that they hesitate not to prefer it to truth, that a man may not die, say rather, that a man who must sometime die may die somewhat later, would have us not only to lie, but even to swear falsely, to wit, that lest the vain health of man should somewhat more quickly pass away, we should take the name of the Lord our God in vain. And there are among them learned men who even fix rules and set bounds when it is a duty, when not a duty, to commit perjury. So again, clearly, whether it's uh, a woman who's going to commit suicide uh, if you don't fornicate with her, or a man who's going to die if you give him some bad news, lying is not on the table. Maybe silence, maybe deception, depending on your, your position and what you think about deception, but lying is not on the table for a Christian in terms of morality. Okay, so I think that's a a pretty good look at some of the main concepts from Augustine in his his work against lying. Um, in all of this, then, we are going to come back to the conclusion from our original episode on lying. Does all of this mean that we always have to straight up tell the truth to everyone? You look fat in that dress. Your son is dead. I'm not going to have sex with you because you are not married, and quite frankly, you never will be because you disgust me. The Jews are right over there behind that false bookshelf. No, of course not. Not lying doesn't mean not being shrewd. Beyond simple truth and lie, we have at least at our disposal silence and gentle speech. But I would also argue that in at least some cases, as with hiding Jews against Nazis, we may even have deception as a legitimate means of action. There may be cases where individuals do not have the right to the full truth. Um, Now, obviously, if you're in the Nazi regime and you are subordinate to the Nazis, technically, they have governmental power over you. But I would argue that perhaps at this point, God's, uh, God's authority would be conflicting with their authority since they're trying to do a great evil. And so for you to not give them the full truth might be a prerogative that you have. Uh, that I, I would be willing to discuss that point and maybe retreat from that point, but it's at least something that I think needs to be considered. All right, so... What is the point of all of this? Obviously, since Augustine agrees with me, I'm right. That's really the ultimate point of this episode. Just kidding. Uh, That's not at all the point. If it were, then I'd be wrong about nonviolence, and I don't think I am. So there were a few important reasons I thought it uh, necessary to circle back around to, to an episode like this. First of all, on a podcast about nonviolence where Augustine is a big name that leads the church away from nonviolence, I think it's important to recognize more of his teachings. And that's important for a number of reasons. Um, It's particularly important here because some of his rationale against lying, I think, undermines his rationale for using violence. And so being more familiar with his work... Um, can be helpful for us to see overlap with nonviolence and argue against him. But secondly, I also like talking about Augustine because he really isn't, he's a, maybe a gateway to state violence, but he's still really conservative in terms of it. And, and I want to remind people of that. So I, I like an opportunity to get to talk about Augustine because he is very different from Second Amendment American Christians. Very different. So familiarity with Augustine is important. Um, Another reason that I wanted to have this episode is because Augustine bridges a gap. If I use Chrysostom or Nazianzus or John of Damascus, I probably won't get Protestants on board. I'm speaking uh, mostly to the Orthodox at that point, and Catholic with with at least two of those. Um, 
in this podcast, I really do want to speak to everybody, but my major experience is Protestant. And Protestants know so little church history, and the church history that they do know has been cherry-picked, and there are only a handful of names that they revere. So let's see, uh, Augustine and Aquinas, and if I was technologically savvy, I'd just play crickets for the next 30 seconds. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Augustine, Aquinas isn't even really an early church father. Um, you just don't really have have people that the that most Protestants like obviously people in seminary and stuff, but most Protestants skip from Augustine to Luther. That that's pretty much it. So Augustine really bridges a gap. He's somebody. He's not going to be as popular in your Orthodox Church, but in terms of uh, the Orthodox already have uh, a what I feel like is a more balanced view of violence, uh, whereas they view it as an evil but a necessary evil, and so they'd repent of it, at least on paper. That's my understanding. So they they really don't embrace violence like we in the West do. And I feel less of a need to talk to them. But even more so, Augustine bridges, just it just bridges a gap, especially with Catholics and Protestants. Now, for an issue like this, there's really not a gap that needs to be bridged with the Catholics because in terms of lying, the Catholics are on board. I mean, they recognize that lying is no good ever on paper. They recognize that at least. I mean, if you talk to your average Catholic, I don't know that they would know that or accept that. But yeah, the Catholic Church recognizes lying as a sin. A third reason I wanted to circle back around to this is because consequentialism is a huge issue. I think it's important to come back to to the issue of consequentialism with great frequency. Since I was able to tie it into an early church father and really dig into this issue, I'm hopeful that it will help those steeped in consequentialism to have their eyes open to it a little bit more. So yeah. That's why we came back to this issue, and I hope it was, it was insightful. I want to start to close out with a quote from John Howard Yoder, because it, it sounds so much like what Augustine is saying here, and really Yoder was the Augustine on the topic of consequentialism, uh, the modern Augustine on the topic of consequentialism that got me to see it. And so when I see this in Augustine, and I recognize, oh, Yoder didn't just come up with this stuff, like... There, there is a long history of the church fighting against consequentialism, even if in our own ways through, through various time periods we embrace, we embrace consequentialism in different areas and we need others to point that out to us. Like we need Augustine here with lying and like Augustine in the Constantinian era might have been able to use us to be able to, to see his flaw with, with violence. So here's a quote from Yoder. Quote, one final note about the lesser of two evils argument. There are evils everywhere, and there will be as long as this world stands. What the Christian seeks to avoid is not suffering evil, but committing evil. If we ask, which is worse, war or slavery? Perhaps to some mind, slavery would be worse. But the question is, which is worse for me to do, kill or be a slave? The answer is simple. The sin my enemies commit is not my first consideration. Loving them is. End quote. So yeah, Yoder, Yoder echoes what Augustine said. The sins of my enemies are not mine to control, though if I can help them to do the right thing, I will. Um, my sin is my own, and I need to take care of myself. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord, right? Well, I've talked long enough. I hope revisiting this topic was beneficial for you. Check out Augustine's books. Um, and I think I'm going to have a, uh, a link to an online version of at least one of his books that should be free. Um, yeah, so links in the show notes. And I think that's it. So that's all for now. Peace. And because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it.